Good afternoon, everyone. Some may, some may not know, but Sister Ambrose Fullerton is from a rural district in Trelawney known as Brampton. Retirement Seventh day Adventist Church happens to be in that district. From time to time, the Fullertons would visit Brampton and beyond the shadow of a doubt, they would be present in church for the entire day on the Sabbath. The Fullertons made their contribution to the church and Elder Fullerton held retirement of the Adventist Church dear to his heart. Sister Fullerton and I are relatives and from religiously every day we would communicate with each other and during these conversations I would always seek to find out how Brother Fullerton was doing. Today I just want to do a song and I hope that you will find comfort in the words of this song. If you've got a problem I'd sure like to share There's one special way out I will show you I care I could offer opinions that might prove untrue but the only sure answer here's what I'll do Just let me talk to my father for you And if I know my father here's what he'll do He will For my father will do it for you. I have never prayed fire down from the sky, but God saw each tear that ever fell from me.
I would be first niece. I suppose I, mean, I was a princess in the family. <laughs> Uncle Eric, as he so affectionately called. Eric Ludlow Fullerton is the fourth of eight children, born to Henry and Lillian Fullerton on the 18th of April, 1945. Uncle Eric spent his early years growing up in the district of Greencastle. His mother taught him and his other siblings at home before he began elementary school. Uncle Eric attended Searchtown Elementary School, where he excelled under the tutelage and mentorship of Lord Rick Brown, who he deemed to be the best teacher ever. Mr. Brown can be credited with giving him a solid foundation on the educational ladder. It was the said Mr. Brown who drove from Sturgeon to Greencastle to encourage his parents to allow him to sit the first Jamaican local exam. He was such a good scholar that he went on to do the second and third year exams. There were so many persons who saw Uncle Eric's potential, namely those at the Greencastle SDA Church. And another person so happened to be my mother, Miss Daisy Wilson, who encouraged him to go on to West Indies College High School. After graduating high school in 1969, he then taught at Blackwoods High School in Clarendon. After leaving Blackwoods, he worked as a, at the collector of taxes in St. Anne's Bay. He had a passion to see young people achieving their full, coming into their full potential. Therefore, he returned to teaching, firstly at Stirton All Aid School, and afterwards at William Nib Memorial High School. However, later on, opportunities arose for him to work in the financial sector. So in 1975, he began working at the St. Anne Cooperative Credit Union, where he spent 12 years. He made invaluable contribution to that institution, growing their revenues beyond expectation. Because of his ability to attract people, my uncle knew how to attract people to him. They, were, they grew the organization, because we know banking and financial organizations grew through our revenue. So he would bring the people in. Because not only was he their banker, but he became what their their financial advisor and their he, they were, he was their confidant. But as I said, they loved and trusted him. It was during this time at the credit union that he garnered the skill necessary to be able to land the position of branch manager at Blaze Trust Company and Merchant Bank Ultras. He spent eight years at Blaze Trust. After the closure of Place Trust, an, an opportunity was offered to him where he could combine his passion for finance and education by becoming Director of Student Finance at Northern Caribbean University, formerly the West Indies College. He accepted this offer and over time he's transitioned into different roles at this institution, roles that allow him to make long and lasting impact on the lives of staff, students and faculty alive. We heard from some of those today. Yes. There is that, of 19, April 18, 1945, when our, Uncle Eric started to the day of his death, his death. And there's that dash in between. There's that, if you look at your program, there's that dash in between. And what we do with those dash is what makes the, the, the biggest difference and that dash, and my brothers and I were speaking recently, we're thinking, there are people who die and pass away. And it really, I'm sorry, I think some people just, they're so easy to forget because that dash, they, they didn't use that dash well. But I can tell you, my uncle used that dash well. Yes. And what I just read, this dash was not only wide, but that's a long dash. And I, I'm going to take a few minutes to go into the other aspects of Uncle Eric. Because Uncle Eric, as, as long as I knew him, my uncle was a spiritual child. He was taken to the Seventh-day Adventist church by his father, 
over time he grew and matured in his relationship with the Lord. And on reaching teenage, he descended to carry on. He descended to take this to another level. And he was such, such, such a dedicated person to his faith that they started to assign him major tasks, even as a teenager. And so Uncle Eric always served the Lord. I never knew, I don't know no of an uncle otherwise. That's what I grew up to know and see of my uncle. Always finding an opportunity to tell you about his relationship and tell you about God. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? Amen. And that was what Ed Uncler always wanted to make sure. And it doesn't matter. Everything else will be burnt up except what you do for God. And so that he always ensured that we that we did, we had a spiritual heritage. He credited his time at West Indies College as a major factor in his spiritual growth and development. Church life was very essential to Uncle Eric. Whatever he achieved in life, he never failed to credit his success with his relationship with God. And for those of you who are seeking, that's the only way. He loved witnessing, and when he became a member of the SDA church, he would go every Sabbath afternoon with Elder Campbell and Brown Jackson and Brother Cross to tell others of the love of God. He became an elder, elder in this very church. Everyone who knew him knew this was an important aspect of his Christian walk. Now we're going to look at another dash, Uncle Eric as a husband. And I'm sorry. Oh, good thing I have, I really have good break. It's no longer there. My timekeeper set out for a while. <laughs> Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Uncle Eric as the husband. I just, you know, I said to Serena, what was that name Uncle Eric always called Miss Amber again? Zini. Zini. Eric met his wife, Amber, in, in 1972. And as I was speaking to Miss Amber, this was something she said to me. She said when she first spotted Uncle Eric, guess what drew, drew her eyes to him? It was the spotless white shirt. She said it was so crisp. The shirt literally glistened. So, because oh, you and I know Uncle Eric, he was Mr. Dapper. Uncle Eric knew how to dress. Even as we were, and Miss Amber was saying, you know, the suit that they're going to put in, you know what she said? We made sure he had his pocket piece. Because Uncle Eric, you had to make sure he had his pocket piece. <laughs> Uncle Eric was meticulous in his dressing. And so it was that same meticulousness that drew Miss Amber to him. She said, I tell you, the shirt glistened, and he had his attached kiss. And who knows that my uncle had presents? Amen? Yeah. And so, she recalled their eyes first met in the day when school were open because she was also a teacher. She didn't see him again until about late October that year and they struck up a conversation. Followed meetings revealed that they shared a lot in common. The meetings became more frequent because courtship did not begin, amen? A proposal was made in 1973. It was made for, and they, mar they got married in 1973. And I, I wanted to stray a little bit. Uncle Eric is the fool. It's, my father was the eldest one, Benji. And Daddy and Uncle Eric would talk all the time. But I remember my, uh, my, my daddy saying to me when Miss Andrew would go out with it, Boy, I'm going to know Eric got us some life, you know. Because all in the pond, me missing it. Me missing And who knows that when it came to domesticated stuff, that was Uncle Eric's 40. So he was very reliant on Miss Amber for stuff like that. My dad was more a little more hands on. And so Uncle Eric, when Miss Amber would go, he'd be like, I can't manage without seeing him. Uncle Eric was the type of, he, he worked tirelessly for his family. 
and would say ever so often that God was his first love and then his family. God was his first, and he made sure he had the priorities correct, didn't it? And that was the reason why they were ill. And I'm sure there must have been hard times. And when I hear people saying, you know, these days they're saying, they're celebrating how many years anniversary. And we, we think we're looking at the good parts. But I'm sure they had, they had their rough moments. What I say to them when you get to these 25 years and people start that pull out and say, happy anniversary. You know, the first thing I say is congratulations. Yeah. Because you made it. Yeah. You stuck with it. Yeah. And I'm sure they had their highs and their low. But one thing they never lost was their commitment to each other. And so, congratulations. My uncle was East. I heard a preacher one time said, he said, he, 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 look at our marriage, I think we lasted this long. He said, um, murder contemplated, but divorce never. <laughs> and so, you know, they stuck it out. And the marriage brought forth. But when he met Miss Amber, she had two children before, and then the marriage brought forth three other children. What we were gonna, and, and I'm going to lead this now into another aspect of Uncle Eric. Uncle Eric, the brother, the uncle. Because one thing, Richard, Serena, Gia, all of us, Kirk, who all of us around here can tell you that there's one thing when we went to Uncle Eric's house, I there were several most of some of us either we had to spend summer holiday. I knew Richard and Serena lived in the same house with Uncle for a season. They can attest they never got treated any less than the children in the house. My uncle, when it says love is kind of is we nowadays we talk about love, we think we, 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 we it's more about lust. Uncle was the epitome of love. As I niece, my uncle, my brother Jason, Dave, uncle was always there for those, whatever that moment, the pivotal moments in our lives, he was up. He would try from, I remember once, I ended up in the hospital. And by the time, I think I must have spent just one night, but by the time I got out, there was Uncle Eric drove from Mandel and, and at the house. Whatever it was, whether, 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 whether they got in trouble, whatever it was, we could count on Uncle Eric to be there. He loved family. If you know what this group, the Fullerton brothers, they loved each other. No matter what little argument, they, they're going to make it up. Uncle Eric loved his brothers. And he loved us, nieces and nephews, no less. That was the man that Uncle Eric. So as I, my father and his brother spoke every single day when my dad was alive. They spoke because they would speak on all sorts of different topics. Because oh, if you knew Uncle Eric, you knew that he was a what? He was not narrow, he was wide. Because knowledge was always something that my uncle sought after. Amen? And so, that is Uncle Eric. Uncle Eric helped start to decline. And I must take this opportunity to commend Miss Ambro, as we so affectionately call her, because she lovingly nursed my uncle. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Yeah. She lovingly nursed my uncle. Yeah. And the thing is that she shared because who knows that when you when you start losing your memory, whatever personality you have, it, it starts in this thing. But you could hide it when you're in your normal senses. When that starts going, you can't hide it. But he was so gentle. She said, no matter what she did for him, he always took the opportunity to say, thank you. I appreciate what you did. Uncle Eric. Uncle Eric Lord Lowe Fullerton is no ordinary man. He was not. Uncle Eric left an impact. Uncle 
Miami. All I thought there is its remains. All right. Amen. That's why it's just. Oh, all that's all there was a means. Uncle Eric was a man who loved. He was a man who walked in dignity. He was a man who was committed to excellence. Whatever you do, do it as on to the Lord. We can go on and on and on about my uncle. In fact, as I was thinking, as I was driving here, I thought to myself, who knows, I might just write his memoirs. Because Uncle Eric was a man who made impact. Live your life in, I would believe he would want to say to you today, live your life in such a way where that dash comes. And my Uncle Eric, if I could think about it, not only did he leave several dashes, but he left them very wide because he made a difference. Yeah. Uncle got ill and over time he passed. Rest in peace, Uncle Eric. He's not here in body, but he will always be in our hearts. We love him. That was the good news of a man who lived a full life, but the greatest message is about to be presented, the message of hope, the message of life. And today, to bring to us that message of hope is one who Devoted his time to the work of the Lord. He has worked in various capacity within the organization. Currently serves as the Executive Secretary of the North Jamaica Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Churches. I speak to us of Pastor Carlington Hilton. He will bring to us a message of hope. But just before he comes, we will have the song of meditation by the Spirit Tree SDA Men's Association. A uh, few words uh, concerning Elder Fullerton. Now we know, like many of you have known him in various capacities, as a student at Northern Caribbean University, uh, he was an elder at the church, at the church. He was a part of our men's association. And there are three things that always stood out about it, Ella Fullerton. The first thing was that he was always very disciplined. He was always very disciplined, and he exampled that in his life, always very disciplined. The second thing that stood out, stood out about uh, Ella Fullerton is the way that he drove. In the morning, when we were going to church, there was always a line of traffic. And at the, at the front of that traffic was Ella Fullerton. And you know, it, it, it happens one day that he brought, my, when my wife was pregnant, he was taking her home. And um, they were in the car, and he was, he was taking his time. He was going slower than he normally goes. So she said to him, Ella Fullerton, it's okay, you, know, you can speed up a little. And he said, no, 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 I'm carrying precious cargo. <laughs> I can't go any faster than that. And that's the second thing, is driving. And the third thing that always stood about, stood out about him is his laughter. Yes. He had this, this way of laughing, and I heard somebody play it earlier today, that pop, pop, pop. When he laughed, he laughed with his body, with his eyes, with his, he laughed with everything. And he was a wonderful soul. And he left an important legacy for us to follow. And we thank God for him and the opportunity that we had to know him. And Sister Fullerton, we offer our condolences. There's so much that we can say. We thank you for lending him to us, for tolerating us, for sharing with us. 
And may the Lord continue to bless you in this time of mourning. I was one lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and the delight from heaven filled my soul. He played my heart with love, and wrote my name above, and just a little with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our children.
Mandeville to be here. However, like Philip, he's part of Open Boat Mario. <laughs> Um, thank God it's not the rapture, we don't teach our priest the rapture. <laughs> but that's where he lands. Today, the Northeast Media Conference, they're having their third quadrennial session. And um, as a delegate at large, he is there. And after this, that's where I'll be taking my flight to. It's good to see you again, Gregory. We go way back. Can I tell you that I met your father before I met him? Yes, I meet him before I met him in the context of uh, when I went to NCU, before I went to NCU, I would have heard of Elder Fullerton in the context that he was in the area of Australian finance. And once you were a student, you would have to pass through him. And though I didn't meet him, I heard about him that this is the man who had a unique laugh. And when you get to student finance and you are challenged financially, he would laugh. And he would open his eyes and he said, how am I going to get my money? I need my money. And I was wondering, Lord, how am I going to face Elder Fullerton? Because I'm going off the NCU and I don't have any money. In 1999, I recognized that he took the transition and then he went over to student uh, development, student bank at that time. And, uh, you know, as a student, I may exchange a few words with him because I was now a student worker. And then we became a bit closer some years ago. I was invited to a funeral at the Brownstone Church and we met. And he said, I was blessed by your words. And so, a couple of weeks ago, I was in the office with Mr. Fuller and Paul. He said, Pastor, my husband passed away. And he spoke so much about you from that funeral. Can you do the chant for us on that day? I checked my diary and discovered that today I'm supposed to be at the Northeast Dominican Conference's session. And they said, there must be something special why I was invited. I'm going to accept the invitation, and I'm going to keep the promise. Right. Are you heads with me today as we pray? Heavenly Father, guide my thoughts. Bring forth comfort as we get and receive the assurance of your promise that one day you're coming back again. To comfort the family today, I pray in the name of Jesus. We say, Amen. This is the full event as I would have kept the promise. Today I want to speak to us on the subject, the power of the promise. The power of the promise. And I'm coming from the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis is a, is a very unique book. It begins with life, and the book ends with death. The book begins with light. As God said that there be light, and there was light. And the book ends in darkness, with a man in a casket, who became the prince of Egypt. However, as uh, the young talks about the dash, there are several promises that comes in the book of Genesis, between Genesis 1 and Genesis 50. The first promise begins after sin, when God intervened and spoke with Adam and Eve, providing a word of comfort after sin, that I'll put an enmity between thee and the woman, between thy son and her seed. God is making a promise that one day the Messiah will come. Yes. But after that promise, there are several promises. Because God will call a man who was not a Christian, he was a heathen. His name is Abraham. And God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 3. God said, I'm going to make a promise unto you. I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And in that promise, God said, I'm going to make you into a great human being. I'm going to make you a great person. You're going to have lots of children. The number of 
our children will be as great as the stars in the heavens and the sand on the seashore. You are going to be a great father. Many years went by, the promise was fulfilled. And even before the promise was fulfilled, here is another promise found in the book of Genesis chapter 15. And I want to read in your hearing. It's a promise, not a nice promise, but it was a promise. Here God said, because in life we have our ups and we have our downs, we have our good times and we have our bad times. And here in Genesis chapter 15, coming from verse uh, 12 on down, and I'm, and I'm going to read it quickly. The Bible says, as the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness covered him. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that your descendants, he never had a child at this time. But God said to him, knowing that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own. And they will be enslaved and, and mistreated for 400 years. How many years? 400 years. This is a promise looking into the future. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. Never had a child, but God said, you're going to have several children, and your children are going to be enslaved for 400 years. This is the promise. Wow. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sins of the Amorites has not yet reached their full measure. And a standard by God would have blessed Abraham not only with Ishmael, but with a promised son, because Ishmael was a mistake. Because Abraham should have gone to Hagar, however God accepted Hagar and said, listen, I will still make Hagar into a great nation. And then Isaac came on the sea, and Isaac had a twin that was Jacob and Esau, and then Jacob had 12 children, and the children kept on multiplying and multiplying. But there was something that was great about Abraham is that before Abraham died, what Abraham did, he was a hard worker just like Elder Fullerton. Yeah. He bought a piece of land where the person had wanted to give it to him as a gift. But Abraham said, no, I can't take your gift. I need to claim it by the hard labor. And Abraham bought a piece of land that was known in the place of Machpelah that when his wife died, Sarah, he buried his wife there. And then after the death of Abraham, Jacob, uh, yes, no, not Jacob, but Isaac, Isaac now inherited that piece of land. And when Isaac's wife died, Isaac buried his wife there. And when Isaac died, his wife was also buried there. The common lot. Yes. And now it is that Jacob, having 12 sons, and, and for some reason, the promise that God made in Genesis 15 was becoming a reality because there was a famine in the land and they had to leave the land where they were, going down into Egypt, and they did spend 400 years. Yes. I'm talking about the power of a promise, and I'm winding up. But what I find interesting, brothers and sisters, that in chapter 49, Jacob was about to die, and Jacob said, listen, when I die, I don't want my remains, I don't want my bones, I don't want my body to remain in Egypt. Please make unto me a promise. And the children of Jacob promised him, and when he died, they left Egypt, and they brought the casket, and they laid it down in the very same place that Abraham bought, where Abraham was buried, where Sarah was buried, where Isaac was buried, where his wife was buried, where Jacob was buried. And so, brothers and sisters, Jacob was laid to rest. But I find something very interesting at the clock. Now it was time for Joseph to die. Joseph never had a good relationship with his brothers. Because Joseph was sold into slavery. But Joseph ascended because God's hands were on Joseph. So you can't put a good man down. So here Joseph ascended into the position of one of the highest eyes. And because of his connection with God, Egypt was on the horizon. And his brothers, I don't know, coming to chapter 49, Joseph's brothers recognized that Joseph was about to die. 
And Joseph called his brothers together. And he said, listen, I wanted to make you a promise. The brothers that you could not trust in life, are you going to trust them in death? They were cruel towards him. So he called him, listen, I wanted to make me a promise because I am about to die. Even though I'm going to die, I want to understand that Egypt is not a dwelling place because, because Egypt is a symbol of sin. God has a better place in store for me. So he called his brothers together and they came together. And Joseph, in verse 22 of chapter 50 of Genesis, Joseph said in Egypt, along with all his father's family, he lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children, also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. But God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of the land, to the land of promise, and off to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110. And after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Bearing in mind that in Genesis 12, God called Abraham and God promised him a land. It was not a time to send God orchestrated every single thing in the life of the patriarchs 400 years. But God still maintained his promise. Amen. And Joseph died with a promise in his heart that even though we are all here in Egypt and we are, uh, they have not yet seen slavery and they have not seen the hardship, but they said, listen, when I die, I don't want my body to remain here. And these brothers, they kept the promise. And Genesis end in a castle. But here is a new beginning. Because Exodus begins with God deciding now to, to intervene. Time is running out, a sign in the hourglass. It is now time for the promise to be fulfilled. And then we started reading about Moses. Because there was a fear who came on the scene who knew not God, nor Joseph, nor Joseph's God, and started to mistreat the people. But during this time, regardless of the hardship that the people were facing and the emotional trauma, and no doubt some may have been wondering, why did God allow these things to be happening? Has God forgotten his promise? No! He has not forgotten. Because there was a casket with the bones of Joseph that stood there as a reminder that one day we are going to leave this place going to a better land that God has promised unto us. Amen. Amen. And so Moses grew. Probably his thought of deliverance was to kill all the Egyptians one by one and bury them in the sand of God. So no, that's not my plan. I'm not plan. You will have to leave Egypt, go into Midian, spend 40 years to unlearn some of the things that you have learned. Mm. And then 40 years, you have to go back and journey in the wilderness. In the wilderness, when the time came and Moses went down to Egypt and spoke to Pharaoh, and the plagues came, not one, not two, but, but ten, with the frogs and the blood and the lice and the hail, you name it. There was something in the minds of the people that one day we are going to leave this land because God has made a promise and we have promised our brother that we will take up his boat from here to our resting place. Yeah. So when you get to Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 13 and verse 9, finally the people said, you know, you need to go. You need to go. I am having a place. To the point that all the firstborn in Egypt, they have died. You have to go. But one thing, brothers and sisters, when they pack their belongings, 
hens, their donkeys, their chicken, their ducks, their goats, whatever they had. Yes. Somebody remembered that many years ago there was a promise that when we are leaving, the bones of Joseph need to come with us. So in chapter 13 and verse 9, someone blow the whistle. We can't leave because there's a promise. The Bible says in verse 17 of Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 13, when you let the people go, God did not lead them on the road to, the, uh, to, to Philistine. Though that was a short, that, though that was a short road. But God said, if they face war, they, they might change their mind and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert by road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. And the Bible said that in verse 19. Moses took the bones of Joseph. He never met. They never met. But he grew up and he heard that there is a unit casket among all the mummies of Pharaoh. This casket is unique because he's a significant person that is lying down there. He is a God-believing person and he has claimed the promise and my faith in you that one day you would leave. Now is the time. And Moses organized six men. Three on one side and three on the other side. It was their duty, Gregory. It was their responsibility to make sure that whatever happens, do not leave this casket behind. They are now marching over two million slaves on their way toward the Red Sea. Before you know it, Pharaoh is coming after them. Mountain on the other side, the Red Sea before them, and they thought that this was the ending of it. But Moses stands still and look and see the salvation of God. In all of that, brothers and sisters, when the rod went up and their feet was about to touch the water, the Red Sea part asunder and someone were there, six men with the casket walking on dry sand going through the Red Sea. The Pope promised, we're not going to leave his remains behind. So they went to the Red Sea, I mean, I thought that that was it. Oh, they started to face some serious struggles. But despite all that, we're not going to put the casket down because we made a promise. That's the power of a promise. They got thirsty. The Mara River was bitter. There were times when, 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 when while going through the wilderness, serpents would come out and some of them would die, but they were still loyal and faithful. We are not going to put the casket of Joseph down. Even if one of you were to die, we still have a mission. Yes, yes, yes. You know what I find interesting? Is that finally, they were now coming out of the land or the wilderness. And they cross over Jordan. And the first encounter they had for 40 years, walking with the casket. The first encounter they had was the largest city, my brother, that was known as Jericho. And God said, I, I know you don't have any spear. I know you don't have any sword. I know you're not warlike because you have never been into any battle before. But listen, you watch. And I take your face. God said, what I want you to do, just walk around the walls of Jericho for seven days, and the rest is up to me. During those seven days of walking, I can just imagine seeing those in Jericho looking down on those Israelites, six men with a casket, walking around the walls of Jericho, and they must have been on the it was not just the priests and the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant because they had the bones of Joseph because Joseph was a part of the promise keeping. And they made a shout, you know the story. The walls came from the door. And I said, Lord, if the brothers of Joseph don't know, they would have died, but they had 
ancestors took over. And they kept such a promise for more than 400 years. When you and I make promises, sometimes we fail. Yes. But when God made promises, Isaiah, when you said, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Amen. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will help thee, I will strengthen thee, I will uphold thee with my victorious right hand. I ask now, divine God, that you will hold the family in the hallowed palm of your hands. I pray, Father, that you will help them to understand that you have been touched with the feelings of our infirmity, so you know exactly what is happening and you have the remedy for such. I pray, Lord, that you will guide their thoughts. There will be days and nights when they will think about the loved ones they, the loved one they have lost 
But I pray, divine God, that you will remind them that you said in your words, when mother and father forsake us, they have not been forsaken. And I know, Father, you will be their daddy. You will take them up and you will be there for them. I ask, Lord, that you will guide their footsteps. Bless their going out and their coming in. I ask, Father, that you will always be there for them. As you said in your words, you will not leave them comfortless. You will come to them. I ask, Lord, that you will help us. That we will be there for them as well. To give them words of encouragement. To motivate them. To pray with them. To pray for them. And to stand by them when they need someone to lean on. I ask, Lord, that you will do for us what we are unable to do for ourselves, do for them far more than they can think or imagine. Father, when you shall come to claim the redeemed of the earth, I pray, Father, that they too will be in the number when the saints go marching in. May those who have listened to the good reports today, may they find something that will, will influence them, Lord, to make a change so that on that grey getting up morning, Father, they will see Brother Fullerton again. I ask, Father, that you will help us to live a life that is pleasing, that when you shall come, we all will hear the well done from your lips and go home to spend ceaseless ages of eternity with you. Until that day comes, Lord, keep us faithful and keep us true. This is my humble asking with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. As we go into the closing exercise, you have been behaving well thus far. And so I ask you to continue the same way. Now we are going to be singing our closing hymn. That the refrain, the platform party will leave, followed by the immediate family members when the rest of the congregation, this is the order in which we will leave. Platform party, immediate family members, the of the congregation. I want to invite everyone to stand at this time as I invite Elder Philip Morgan to lead us in the closing song. Under his way, I'm safely abiding. <laughs>
www.ascensiontracks.com www.ascensiontracks.com
Right after the two, one, two. They resound, they resound with God's own heart. Or let the ancient words impart. Ancient words, ancient words ever, true, ever true. Change in me, change, change in me. And change in you. We have come. We have come. We have come. let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of, life. Words of, hope. Words of hope, give us strength, give us strength. Help, us help us hope. In this world, in this world, we 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 ancient words will guide us. Hope. Ancient words, ancient words, changing me, changing me. me, we have come. We have come with open hearts. Oh, oh, let the ancient words be taught. Holy words. Holy words. Of our faith. Of our faith. Hand them down. Hand them down. To this age. To this age. Came to us. Came to us. To sacrifice. To sacrifice. To give the faithful words of Christ. To give the faithful words of Christ. Holy, ever, ever true, change in me, change in me, change in you, and change in you. We have come, we have come, with open hearts, with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient oh, words impart, the ancient words impart. Holy words, holy words, long preserved, long preserved, for our work in this for world, our work in this world. world. They resound. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words, ancient words, ever true. Changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words. One more time with a chorus. Ancient words, ancient words. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want, all right? To the happy wanderers, too. After two, one, two. The Lord's my shepherd, I not want. He makes me down to love. He passes freely in me. The quiet waters come. My soul you do it restore again. My soul you do it restore again. And make me and me to walk that way. Within the path of righteousness, in for his own sin. He lives. He lives. He lives. He lives. He lives. I know the power in him. Yes, he lives.
Amen. Thank you so much for your lovely singing. Now the scripture I'm going to be reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to the end. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the words of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18 says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And so, for as much as God has permitted His son, Eric Ludlow Fullerton, to fall asleep in Jesus Christ, we do lovingly commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, remembering that the issues of life are in the hands of the everlasting Father, and he has promised eternal life to all those who believe in him. At this time, as the workmen will work to cover the grave, we are going to be singing him away in style. Amen? Amen. 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 Right, so we continue with the songs in our program. We go to under his wings and sleepily abide. After two, one, two. Under his wings and safely abide. She said that. And the first one, my home is in heaven, just waiting for me. 
All right, up to two. One, two. One more time. My, My home is in heaven, just waiting for me. And when I reach there, oh, how happy I'll be. My home is in heaven, no rain to pay. My dreams are saving. I love that man from Galilee. One more time, I, I love, love that man, man from Galilee. Glory oh. has done so very much for me. Oh, he has taken all my sins and the Holy Ghost in me. I, I love, love that man, that man from Galilee. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody has to know who Jesus is. Everybody has to know. Some people don't know. Everybody has to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Who Jesus is Everybody ought to know.
of glory.
a sweet Jesus. What a wonder you are. You are brighter than the morning star. Oh, you are fairer, more fairer than the hill that grows by the way. You are precious, more precious than gold. One more time I say, sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus. What a wonder you are. You are precious, more precious. No grave can hold my body. Just thank you for me. And when I reach there, I'm happy I'll be. My home is in heaven. My home is in heaven. No rent to pay. My Jesus paid it. Paid it all for me. One more time, my home is in heaven. Just waiting for me, and when I reach there, I'll be happy. My home is in heaven, no rent to pay. My Jesus paid, paid it all for me. No grave can hold my body down. No. Moving on the King Highway. Moving on the King's Highway. In amazing trust in amazing grace. 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 In amazing Moving on the King's Highway, trusting in amazing grace. Satan is on my track. Never, never, never turn back. Moving on, moving on, moving on. Oh, no. I'm going to keep trying. on the King's Highway. The man said he has to render it. Close as a brother, my Jesus is 
in the land of sunshine, in the land of we are there to be Accept of God's blessing and to him be joined. Then when Jesus cometh, he will call for you. Everybody, we are there. We are nearing home. We are nearing home. We are nearing home. See the splendor gleaming from the tombs of France. See the glory. Truth and gates and giants. Here we go. We enter there from the tomb. One more and one more. One more and one more. One more and one more. We are near. All right, all right, we are almost through. But at this point, I'm going to ask the workmen to pause just for a short moment as I pray to close. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father and our God, we thank you again for the life of your son, Eric Fullerton by name. We ask right now that you mark this spot. So, Lord, when the resurrection morning comes, then Elder Fullerton will rise in the first resurrection. I pray, O oh God, that we would have been impacted by him even today as we have this Thanksgiving service. I pray that all of us will be drawn closer to Jesus Christ and we will live for him so that all of us, when the sky shall burst asunder, the eastern sky shall burst asunder and you shall come. I pray that all of us, because of this service, will be a part of your eternal, eternal kingdom, I ask. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen and amen. amen. Thank you so much, workmen. want to thank you so much amen. for working so expeditiously in covering the grave. want to thank my choir members for the songs that you have sung. All right? Thank everyone for coming. I pray that you'll continue to um, support the family as they need it more than ever. All right? And they, I'm sure that they wish to express their sincere gratitude unto you. Thanksgiving. Uh, for your support, for your prayers, and uh, words of comfort. Uh, continue to do that as they go through this dear time of bereavement. Thank you so much. May the, the Lord bless you as we await Him. All right? Thank you so much, man. You remembered.